But uh, okay, all right, I got two places I want you to turn. Well, three places technically, but two to start off with. I want you to go to Romans 15, Romans 15, and James 5. Romans 15 and James 5. We will read those back to back, and then I'll have you go to our third place, which we will be staying. All right. Romans 15, James 5. And you should get there, we'll pray for the service, and uh, hop into this thing. All right. Romans 15, James 5. Brother Jeff Fisher just texted me. So he's uh very pray for them up in Michigan. Um, and uh, I think they were up Sunday, and then now they're up there again, different family and things up that way. So be in prayer for them as they uh, as they travel. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, bless them as they travel, Brother Jeff and uh, Miss Brianna. Uh, Fisher, as they travel, give them safety on the road. Thank you for bringing uh, Luke in Houston and uh, Nico and Bob back from Michigan safely. Lord, anytime I'm, uh, you know, I hear people that travel and, and things, Lord, tires blow out all the time. Accidents happen all the time. And Lord, not that we should walk around all worried and, and uh, wringing our hands, uh, but Lord, we should remember what James and the rest of Scripture teaches that life is brief and life happens so quickly and so fragile. So, Lord, help us to keep that in mind, and, and that helps us to be uh, uh, to be praying without ceasing. And then, Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless tonight the folks that are here tonight uh, that have showed up, that uh, uh, worked all day and did whatever they had to, and, uh, and they managed life, and they, they got here. Lord, I ask that you would help us in your work tonight, uh, that we may grow uh, in, in our knowledge of your word and be closer to Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans 5, Romans 5, verse number 4, and then we're going to go to James, the book of James. All right, Romans 15, verse 4, it says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant to you, excuse me, uh, grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. Now the God of all patience, now you're going to need to remember that word, patience. The God of all patience. And consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. All right, go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Yes. Romans 15, 4. No. Romans 15, verse 5. All right, Romans. Go to Romans 15. You said verse 4, but verse 5 is right next to it, so it's kind of easy. Fine. Gotcha. You did say Romans. I, I apologize. All right, so Romans 15, 4 and 5. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, which is, this is the correct one. I just got excited on that word patience. Here you go. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, remember that word by the time, aforetime, because when we go to our third place, you're going to know, oh, this is aforetime. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience now we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus all right now James chapter 5 James chapter 5 James chapter 5 verse number 10 take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. We have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. All right, go to the book of Job. Job. This one Sunday school a kid of mine we used to call it Job. Job. There's a whole book in the Bible about jobs. <laughs> I said, nope. It's actually pronounced Job. He said, English is dumb. <laughs> I said, all right, if you say so. Uh, but uh, the book of Job. The book of Job. Now, I want you to camp there for a minute. We'll uh, start dissecting this. 
Uh, but uh, I want to give you an introduction into this. I know that the book of Job, um, uh, I, as I thought about the book of Job, and I thought about my introduction into the introduction of the book of Job, I thought to myself, uh, how often is Job preached at? For me, not very often. So, of course, my worldview of um, the, the abundance of which Job is taught or preached out of would be very, very, very narrow because uh, if I do listen to uh, guys online and, and um, uh, YouTube or, or uh, uh, CDs or whatnot, uh, it's not always out of Job. Most of the times it's out of, it's out of new, it's new Testament stuff or some pretty popular stories in the Old Testament. But uh, uh, Job, I, I haven't heard uh, a lot of uh, deep diving into Job. I know over the years at, at church here we, we have. Uh, Pastor Jackson was usually pretty thorough uh, with uh, becoming familiar with the book. But when I was a kid, um, and we would read our Bibles through every year. We had Bible reading charts, and we'd read our Bibles through um, in the year. That was the goal. And uh, I always dreaded, dreaded getting to certain places in the Bible because I was a kid. I didn't know what was, I didn't know what was saying. I didn't know what was talking about. Uh, I remember at one time in Family Devotions, though, we were kind of going around um, the room there talking about favorite books and difficult books. And uh, I said, I don't like the book of Job. Job. From a, whatever, a 10, 11, 12 year old boy's mind, Job. Job, and I said, all he does is complain the whole time. <laughs> I had no clue. I had no clue. And now uh, now that I've grown up, I, I, I see it. I can understand reading comprehensions a little bit more in tune. I kind of understand and follow the story a little better. But the book of Job has been long praised. It's been praised for quite some time um, to many people uh, that had better reading composition comprehension than I did at the time. But as a, some folks say, it's a, almost a masterpiece of literature. A masterpiece of literature. Uh, one fellow said that tomorrow, if all literature was to be destroyed, and it was left to me to retain one work only, he said, I should save Job. Wow. I want to know what he's getting out of that book. I want to know what he sees. I want to know. Uh, the greatest poem, whether ancient or modern literature, said Tennyson about Job. The book of Job, uh, Daniel Webster said, the book of Job, taken as a mere work of literary genius, is one of the most powerful productions of any age or of any language. Well, uh, seeing how Job gets some high praise and it has been canonized as scripture, it's a part of the Bible, uh, what is it about the book of Job that prompts this kind of praise? What is it this that what is it about the book of Job that uh, people uh, uh, love so dearly? Uh, a lot of Christians I know don't really feel that way about the book of Job. It, 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 honestly, the book of Job just kind of goes under the radar. Uh, if we were to ask the favorite books of the Bible, uh, I immediately I would say uh, for me personally, uh, Psalms and Acts. Psalms and Acts. Psalms because what it does to my soul. Acts because, man, it's a, it's a, it's an incredible tale. It's an, it's an adventure. To me, it's a spiritual. Man, I look at that and go, whoa! Not only Pentecost and the ascension of Christ and everything that that came after Christ and and all that happened, but the life of these apostles and the things that happened and transpired and some of the sermons that are preached in there. Stephen rips. Paul lets it loose. Peter, man, these guys preach the word of God, and it's exciting. Other than that, man, I really like that book. I really like Acts. I really like Psalms. Those are exciting books, and there's others that I'll pull out of there. But just to the, the, the top of my head, those two. But for me personally, personally, and for many people that I've known, uh, I, I, we go around rooms and classrooms and whatnot. We, what's your favorite book? I never hear Job. Job. Well, well, well I, I think maybe, maybe it's perhaps because it. I think many people tend to neglect, and we should not let this be said about us. If you have a a, 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 a a Bible, a King James Bible, and it's got sixty, it has sixty six books in it. You should be familiar with all sixty six. You shouldn't say, "Well, we're New Testament Christians; we really don't pay attention to the Old Testament." That should not be it at all. Uh, we should be familiar with the Old Testament, uh, for it is one what the New Testament is built on. The New Testament is built upon the Old Testament. 
the foretelling and the prophecy of the Lamb that would come. The Lamb that would come along. What is it? Um, Genesis to Malachi. The Savior is coming. The sa Malachi. Yeah. The Savior is coming. The Savior is coming. The Savior is coming. Uh, Matthew through the beginning of Acts, the Savior is here. He's here. He's here. And Acts through Revelation, He's coming again. He's coming again. And we have to, we can't just skip over portions of the Bible. It's familiar, so familiar. we got to become familiar with the Word of God. Uh, Paul wrote Paul wrote about the value of that in, in what we just read in Romans 15.4. In Romans 15.4, he said, again, he said, uh, 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 for whatsoever things were written aforetime, whatever things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. They were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We might have hope. And then James once again echoes that same sentiment in James 5. He says, y'all heard of the patience of Job? Y'all remember that? It wasn't for nothing. It was for our learning today. Our learning today. So uh, uh, it's important that we remember or we write it down. Note that the Old Testament was written for our learning. Highlight that, underline that in your Bible. Um, uh, uh, and it provides patience, the Bible says, and comfort. Patience and comfort. What I glean, what I glean from the book of Job in a summation would be this. For, for my own practical use would be, if I've committed my life to God, in the fact that he is God, and, and I'm not talking about if I was Jake Jackson where Job was then. I'm talking about if I had a Job-like experience now. It would, and, and that goes for any Christian. It would be incumbent, it would be important upon the Christian to do exactly what Job did. And I don't mean in the sense of um, uh, tearing your clothes and going and sitting in a pile of uh, ashes and uh, scraping yourself with a posture. You know, go to the hospital, they can help you. Uh, but I mean spiritually. What happened to him spiritually? Job, the scriptures, and I'm, we'll get to this, it says he never charged God foolish. He never charged, he never pointed his finger to God and said, God, you, and then you fill in however you want to fill it in. Maybe like some of us have done. But we can say, no, I, I know who I believe and I am persuaded. That he's able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I will not. I'm not going to, to, to cross the line here. I'm not going to turn my back on God. Because I know that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There's a time for birth and a time for death. There's a time for riches and a time for poverty. There's a time for war. There's a time for peace. And this is just a time in my life for me to go through whatever it is that I'm going through. And I cannot worry. I talked to Dr. Harrington for about 40 minutes uh, last Saturday night uh, before bed. I, I talked to her for a while. And she um, uh, she talked about, you know, hard times and, and, and uh, you know, being in need and different things like that. And I said, Doc, I said, you kidding me? I said, uh, and I kind of just, just very light issues. I said, this and this and this and this. And I said, I used to lose my mind over those things. Now, and not that I don't care, but I'm like, eh, okay. No big deal. There's, there's spiritual growth. There's spiritual growth. And I don't, man, I, my daughter doesn't have transverse myelitis. I, 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 I don't know if everybody here knows this, but um, and it's not it's not private, but it's not something we just want to, I, I have a hard time just spouting off bad things that have happened in people's lives, but I didn't have to shoot my son. I didn't have to bury any of my sons yet. Uh, I have all my digits. I have both my legs and both my arms. I'm not blind. I can smell. I can taste. I can, I can, I can see. I can hear. I can speak. And those are the things that we all just kind of take for granted. Uh, uh, so, so before we go looking at the life of Job and, and analyzing the life of Job and kind of peering into it, even though it's definitely needful. We also need to put on a thinking cap. We also need to put on our, our, our serious thoughts here and say, man, what if I have throughout my life, not a whole Job experience all at once, but what if I get some bits and pieces of Job experience in my life? 
Listen, all these things that happened to Job, they happened in the same day, back to back to back to back to back. Well, what if in five years, one of these calamities happens to you, and then two years, another one, and then ten years, another one? See, Job took it on the chin, and he took it well. <laughs> See, we get, a, we get a flat tire, and we, we lose our minds. You know, something bad happens and comes along, and we kind of, kind of lose it all. And, and we, we can't allow that to happen. We have to, according to the Scriptures, to say we learn and get everything that we need with patience and comfort from where? The Scriptures. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the Word of God, Scriptures, is just another, just another uh, 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 identifier of the Word of God. The Scriptures. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And, saw, uh, and Paul said it, and James said it. These things that happened aforetime happened for our learning, for our patience, for our comfort. You don't have the patience you need. You don't have the comfort you need. You don't have the learning you need. Because we are detached from that book. We're detached from it. Now, you, I, I, if you're like me, you get up in the morning, you're like, oh, I know I need to read it. I know I need to read it. And then you didn't read it. You go throughout your day going, I know I need to read it. 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 You know, when our stomach tells us that we're hungry, and it growls and it rumbles, you know what we do? We listen. They go, I need to eat something. I need to eat something. Same thing when we're thirsty. When we're thirsty, we need to quench it. We need to quench it. Same thing when we're cold. Man, I'm cold. Man, I'm cold. Goodness, I'm cold. You know what you need to do? You need to find somewhere to warm. Vice versa, hot and cold. You need to cool off. You need to warm up. We listen and obey those things of our body. Why is it? Listen, we've been told. We're new. You're a new creature. You've been born again. You have a new spirit, a new man inside of you. And he doesn't care for the flesh. He cares for the things of the spirit. And yet we starve that new man. We freeze out of that old man. And we, or that new man. And we let that new man sweat. And we don't give in. We don't obey the necessities of the spirit. It's vital. It's vital that we make this Bible. We make the word of God. A, a, a part of our day and a part of our life, each and every, uh, each and every uh, a, a moment of our of our uh, existence. So, because the Book of Job, uh, in in, to, in in my understanding, has been uh, neglected, uh, or just kind of we just kind of read through it and we never dig into it, um, and kind of neglected, it presents though valuable lessons. See, when James said, when James said. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. He didn't say Noah. He didn't say Elijah. He didn't say Elisha. He didn't say Abraham. He didn't say Sarah. He said Job. That right there is putting emphasis. Hey, if, if somebody else is, is making mention of somebody from the Old Testament, I, want, I might want to go check that out. I might want to go check it out. So we, we should uh, uh, dive into that. So Christians, we should certainly take time to study to study this portion. Now, um, there's all kinds of questions to, have, to be asked, and maybe you wouldn't think to ask them, and I wouldn't necessarily even have, know how to go about answering all of them. Um, uh, but the place of Job in the Old Testament, where does that stand? How does that, how does that add, you know, where does that, um, how does he add up to Abraham? How does Job add up to Genesis? Well, Job is the first of um, five books commonly known as poetry. Poetry, and that's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, so and so on. Um, uh, and it's um, called as such because they're written in a poetic, a poetic style. A poetic style, uh, which is just a contrast, if you will, to other books. Uh, they're often referred to as um, the literature of wisdom. Literature of wisdom. Um, and uh, one person put it this way, Job, how to suffer. Psalms, how to pray. Proverbs, how to act or behave. Ecclesiastes, how to enjoy. And Song of Solomon, how to love. So the poems, the, these poems, these five books, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, are the poetry of how to. How to. How to suffer, how to pray, how to act, how to enjoy, and how to love. How to love. Now, um, I, I know this is the introduction but because I have no solid 
no solid, backed up, for sure uh, uh, answers of who, who wrote the book of Job. Well, some say Job. Some say Moses. Some say, oh, who else do I have written down here? Oh, um, uh, uh, Barak, who was a, um, a scribe of Jeremiah. Um, Hezekiah, Solomon, Elihu, Isaiah. Uh, all these different people. Who, who wrote it? Who wrote it? Who wrote it? I don't know. When was it written? Well, some say that uh, he could have been a contemporary of Abraham during Abraham's time. We do know that it is one of the most ancient, one of the oldest books in the Bible, according to these um, uh, these sources of its style and uh, certain references made in it. Um, but some folks say it was written before Moses, around pre-1500 B.C. Others say that, oh, it was around the time of Solomon, which is 900 B.C. I don't, I don't take to that much. But, um, uh, uh, and some even say it's as late as the Babylonian exile, uh, which you'd say, I don't even know when that was. So, Brother Jackson, we really don't care. Uh, we, don't, we don't care that it, who wrote it and when it was written as much as we do want to know what are we supposed to learn from it. What patience are we supposed to pull from it? What comfort are we supposed to get from it? What is the lesson of this book in the Bible that we're supposed to get? Uh, well, what is the purpose of this book? And uh, I believe it's common to suggest that the purpose of the book is to answer this age-old question that's still asked to this very day. Why does God allow good people to suffer? Why does God allow good people or righteous people to suffer? And that's, that's certainly a good question. And I believe that's the question that Job raises here. If you read about the, the character and the testimony of Job, hey, there's no man like Job in the land. Job's the cream of the crop. He's got the big family. He's got uh, his uh, dedicated and loving wife. He's got, he has a, 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 a cattle on a thousand hills, amen. He has, he has, Friends, I guess you could say. We find about find out about that later. Uh, a, a very uh, wealthy man, prosperous man, and that's a question. But I think it's worthy to note for us again to remember uh, uh, to remember, write it down that Job himself never ever in this book receives a direct answer from God on why. Why? Job would never received the answer. Now here's the awesome thing. Job didn't receive the answer about why, but we did. We understand why. Now, you say, well, do we really? Yes, we do, because when we start to dissect these, this verse by verse and portions of Scripture by portions of Scripture, we'll see whose fault it was. See, God did not cause it, but God allowed it. God didn't cause it. He didn't cause cancer, but he allowed it. He didn't cause drug addiction, but he allowed it. He didn't cause um, a broken home and violence, but he allowed it. He allowed it. Why did, well, that doesn't make sense. Why would he allow it? Oh, uh, well, it's this thing called, and I, I, this, is a, this is usually a, uh, a, an un, unmanageable uh, situation, unmanageable topic, because it can run wild. But two words called free will, or if you will, liberty. Liberty. You are free to do what you would like to do, but you are not free from your consequences. Yeah, that's right. You're not free from your consequences. That's right. Now, why does, why does God allow the righteous to suffer? Or why does God allow good things or bad things to happen to, to good people? Uh, again, Job never gets an answer on that. We don't necessarily even have the, the full scope of the answer. Um, uh, so, so other than that, we, it brings us to Satan's challenge. It brings us to a challenge by Satan. Um, and he says, uh, and we're not going to go there yet, but, but we will in verse number 9 of chapter 1. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not? Doth Job fear God for not? And for not means for nothing. Does he fear you for nothing? You've got nothing to fear from you. You've got him protected. He has nothing to fear. You, you, you've got him all hemmed up. You've got a hedge about him. And so Satan challenged, uh, the, the challenge of Satan, and God allows Job to suffer in answer to the challenge. See, Job was just collateral damage. Job was just the, the, um, the subject matter of a challenge between God and, or between Satan and God. 
Job was just caught in the middle. But here's the wonderful thing. Here's the wonderful thing. Uh, and I'm kind of bypassing some things. But Job, yes, he's kind of like just that, that, that collateral damage. He's just caught in the middle between the body, between Satan and God, and back and forth and whatnot. And, and uh, uh, Job, trusting in God, here's the wonderful thing about God. God can make these dead, dry bones preach again. God can take a, a, a life that's ruined, a life that's been wrecked, a life that's been full of bad decisions, and the moment that that individual has understood their error, has said, man, did I mess that whole thing up? They can turn back to God and have that, from Sunday's message, that reconciliation. But it's a whole lot better to never leave home in the first place. It's a whole lot better to be thrashed by Satan and say, hey, do your worst. What the worst you can do is kill me. Worst you can do is kill me. Yeah, you already killed my family. You ruined my body with these boils and sores. You killed all my wealth. You killed all my prosperity. You killed off my popularity. People walk by me now and they sneer. People walk by me and they go, eh. I can hear some people, they pity me. And then there are others who point their finger at me and say, we knew he was faking it the whole time. Listen, people didn't just start coming out of the woodwork. No. They started coming out of the woodwork, but there were haters in the woodwork before they ever started coming out. There always will be. There always will be. Uh, if you leave from the front, somebody will always be criticizing you from behind. And if you're in the middle of the pack, somebody behind you will be criticizing you from there. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're striving for success and prosperity and there's blessing on your life, somebody somewhere is going to look at you sort of funny and judge you uh, unrighteously. And then there will be others who are for you, rooting for you. Yeah, proud of you. And when you fall down flat on your face, you're going to hope. You're going to hope somebody's there to be like, hey, man, I've been where you are. Come on, let's go. Get up and we can do it again. Don't worry about it. He said, yeah, but you don't know how I fell or where I fell or the style in which I fell. You don't know what I've done. Oh, I don't even know what you've done. Even if it's broadcast for everybody to know. He knows what you did. And if he's forgiven you, who am I to not forgive? Sidebar. All right. The purpose of the book. The purpose of the book uh, is, is not, and this is the way I look at it. It's not, why does God allow the righteous to suffer? Or why do good, bad things happen to good people? I, I look at it and I ask this question. How? How should the righteous suffer? Not why. We are partakers with Christ. We, we are living behind enemy lines, folks. We, we right now, at this very moment, if you are a born-again Christian, you are blood-bought. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, you can say, I remember the day when the Lord saved me. And you can say, um, it was on a Sunday, somebody touched me. It was on a Sunday, somebody, amen. And yes, it must have been the hand of the Lord. And you can say, I know, I know that I know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven because what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, and I believed him, I put my faith and trust in him, and I'm clinging to that old rugged cross. Great. Now you're in for it. You say, what do you mean I'm in for it? Well, now, now you, 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 you have God against you. God says, for there is no condemnation to them that are, uh, um, there is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But they are, uh, but I'm mixing these verses here, but they that believe not are condemned already. They that believe aren't condemned. They that believe not are condemned already. You're one way, you gotta pick, pick who you're gonna fight against. And you join Team Jesus, that's cool, that's great. But it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room, it's a fight. It's a war. It's not a game. So you can run from it and, 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 and hide from it and go live with the world and kind of blend in. Or you can try to stand up and do something for Jesus. And that was the life of Job. Job was an honest man. He, had a man. he was a man of integrity, ethics, business sense. I believe he dealt right and fairly with everybody. And, and uh, uh, he was, from what we understand, a godly man. God had put a hedge about him. He put a hedge about him so you can live for God. You say, man, if Job was the I mean, the best man in the, in the earth that they knew of, and Satan still thrashed on him like that, what does that do for me? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think there are a whole lot of people who probably have the godliness that Job had. And I, I'm not trying to, I'm not casting a judgment on anybody, but I, I, I strive to be a Job. We've got to strive to be a, a Job in the sense of 
And does the devil even take any interest in you at all? Now, on a, on a, on a logical basis, I don't want the devil to take notice of me. I don't want the devil to be like, hey, you see what that, see what Doug Jackson said? I thought we took care of that Doug Jackson guy. Now we got another one to deal with. I don't, I don't want it. I don't want that. And that is why I'm becoming more and more in love with the book of Job. Because the God that protected Job and said, Job, you went through it all. And man, man, son, I'm, you, you get double everything you had on the other side. Not for the sake of having double of everything else. Or double of I got six kids. I don't want twelve. Uh, but um, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't have twelve kids. That's kind of a lot. Uh, but uh, uh, double, double honor, double portion. Fill his coffers back full of candles. Man, I, I, I don't care to have the wherewithal to, to 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 take that beating like Job did. It's something that every Christian ought to strive to say. I don't know that if I will ever suffer the amount that Job suffered. But I want to be willing to take it like he took it. So not why do Christians suffer, but how should they suffer? Because it's going, it's coming. It's coming. You know that in this world you shall have tribulation. We're supposed to pick up our cross and go to our Golgotha. We're supposed to pick up our burdens. We're supposed to walk with God. And when we walk with God, the enemies and the hordes of hell and of earth are against you. They're against you. You wonder why your, your employer or your boss or, or a, 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 a whoever, a family member, man, they just don't like you. They're against you. They do everything to, to trip you up and make you fall. And I'll tell you why. Because your life is a living testimony and it's a, and it's a living testimony of conviction to, the, to them. If you let your light shine and you live it out as a Christian and you say, no, sir, I can't work on Sundays. I'm in church. I'm in church. I'm in church. There were three guys that um, I would answer the phones for um, uh, when they called when I was working for Penske. I had four. Uh, four of them. Uh, a guy named uh, John. What? Yeah, John. Uh, Robert. Oh, two Johns. Two John and a Brian. John, 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 Robert, and Brian. Well, uh, oh, who was the, the second John? He, um, uh, he'd call me. He'd call me and we'd get to talking and he'd say, hey, uh, you know, uh, I got this blah, blah, blah. I got to run on Sunday. He'd say, I, I can't run on Sunday. He said, I'm in church. I'm, I drive a bus on Sundays. I teach in a Sunday school class. And I preach sometimes. I said, so I can't. I, not on Sundays. In my interview, I went in and told him, sat down with this guy, big John, big, big number one John. I like John. He was cool. Uh, good guy. Still pray for him to this day. Uh, uh, big John sitting in the desk. He said, when he started talking, I said, listen, you can have me. I said, I'll be the best employee that I possibly can be, but I, you cannot have Sundays. You can't have them. They're off the table. And don't even call me. He laughed. He laughed. He said, okay. Okay. He said, all right, we'll work out your schedule. No Sundays. I said, all right, cool. No Sundays. Nope. Nope. Well, guess what? I, I knew that some people went into work and they'd call me, hey, man, we all got called in on this Sunday. Uh, or Monday would roll around, we'd be sitting in the mandatory meeting, you know, and they'd be talking about working yesterday. <clears throat> Where'd you run? I didn't run. What do you mean you didn't run? I didn't run. I went to church. I drive a bus. I do these things. I don't care if it rubs people the wrong way or not. You live your life, I'll live my life, and we'll both stand before God and answer for it, and we'll find out who was right and who was wrong. Now, now, you're going you're gonna to rub some people the wrong way. That's guaranteed that, that Job, Job, folks, Look at the Bible sometimes and think these are aliens. They're not aliens. These were real people. They had hearts. They had flesh. They got cavities. They got poked in the eye. You cut them and it bleeds. They, they stuck their toe on a leg, oh, you know. <coughs> and, and they ouched around the house like everybody else. They ran from dogs just like everybody else. You got to believe that mailman back then. He was afraid of dogs just like the ones are now. They were humans. These were real people. So you think of all the scenarios and the kind of mankind that is here now. There was, there was a portion of people back in Job's day who treated Job just like some haters treat you now. That's just the way it was. But I look at, I look at the book of Job and I think, not why, but how should we suffer? What is the right way for a Christian to suffer? Now, while Job's questions and complaints often come close, um, to charging God and saying, God, you did me wrong. 
He never does, in fact, cross that line. Uh, uh, how many of you have ever um, been stern with the Lord? I'll raise my hand. All right, okay, so just some, okay, cool. All right, I have before. I've gotten out of the car. I've walked down the road. I've, uh, whatever, went out to the field. And I'm like, Lord, what's the deal? What are you doing? Here I have. Lord, I've dedicated my life. I've said I have decided to follow Jesus. And I kind of feel like he doesn't know where he's going. You said, Brother Jackson. No, I'm whatever. Uh, he hasn't struck me dead yet. I look at it and say, man, what, what is going on? I feel like, man, if I could have just... If, if, if I wouldn't have been so conflicted as a teenager um, and wondering, man, what is this What is this voice inside of me? Is that the Lord? Is that me? What is, is, this, is, this, uh, is this some sort of religious guilt? If I go seek some sort of career that pulls me out of uh, every Sunday service and every Wednesday, what is this? God, I'm conflicted. And to be honest, standing here today, I'm glad he can. I was glad I'm glad I'm confl I was conflicted. I'm glad to this day that I was conflicted. For the simple fact of it brought me to where I am now. It, and it was inevitable. I was going to end up somewhere. You were going to end up somewhere, but it's better to be down a somewhat of a destitute road and broke with Jesus and with God than it would to be have your pockets full. And, and everything you need in life and, and not be with the Lord and not have the Lord and not have him uh, uh, uh. Man, what an incredible testimony that God said yeah, say, you go ahead and mess with Job that bet you he doesn't turn on me what a testimony what a testimony and here I am, I get a little splinter so to speak, and I go to God and God's like Come on, Jackson. Yeah, yeah. boo hoo. <laughs> get with it. Come on now. Uh, and, and I'm not saying I want to ever get to the point <laughs> where Satan goes to God and says, Hey, uh, that Jake guy, I bet he curse your name if you did some of this to him. I don't want God to ever sit there and go, Man, Satan, you're probably right. Jake would be acting this way, wouldn't he? I don't want Satan to ever be right ever be right and God to confirm it when it has anything to do with my loyalty to God. Now I stand here today and I say, man, I want to I, I would die for Christ. I would die for God. When the real test of that is, would you live for him? If, you, if you'd live for him, you'd probably die for him. You, 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 you might lay down your life for the Lord, physically. But if you don't lay down your life for the Lord, you'd never be willing to take a bullet for him. You'd never be willing to put your head on the chopping block for him. I'm not saying Job was willing, but Job was conflicted and confused in here. He said, man, what's going on? What is the deal with this? So, so some of the lessons I pull from, from the book of Job is, is, is this, and, and, and we'll hop into it. I, I, I have, we're going to go to chapter one and, and um, uh, just briefly in chapter two very quickly. I'm going to give you three quick things, three quick things. Um, and then we'll continue it next week. So the book of Job, the book of Job, um, uh, the book defends the absolute glory and perfection of God. Now, when I say that, I'm saying it sets forth a theme, a theme that's echoed in Psalm 18, where it says, I'll call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I'll call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. And that's what Job did. And you see what happened to Job? Bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. What did he do? Of course he went into mourning. Of course his heart was broken. I'm sure some tears fled down his face. But what did he say? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, I, you're going to have to take a step back in line. And here you are driving around. Here you're driving a Beamer now. You just watch out when you drive that 1997 Grand Caravan that breaks down out tin soul. Oh man, you got you you you, uh, you got that job now. Pays real well now. Well, what about when you don't have that job and you kind of wondering, man, how am I going to pay this and how am I going to get that done? Life life is not all about ascension. It's about ascension and falling down, and ascension and falling down, and ascension and falling down. And that's that's just the ebb and flow of life. It's what happens. And 
If you can praise God, real spirituality is praising God in the valley like you can praise Him on the mountaintop. Can you praise Him in the valley like you praise Him on the mountaintop? And, and, and if you can do that, that's a wonderful thing. You should teach others also and be that, be that shoulder for people to lean on uh, as you continue to, to help and nourish the spirituality of other Christians. God is deserving of our praise simply on the basis of who He is. God is worthy of our praise, not because I have two eyes to see, not because I have all my faculties, not because I have healthy children and a wife of 16 years, not because I'm a pastor of a church, even though I thank the Lord for all those things. The Lord is to be praised simply because of who he is. I remember talking to a Christian in the back of the auditorium one time, and they said, that doesn't really do it for me. I said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. You can sit there and not like some things about God all you want. It doesn't change a thing. It doesn't change it. I just don't really like the fact that God killed this person. God did that. So what? Like it, lump it. What were some of the things Brother Hamlin would say? Uh, I said put it in your pipe and smoke it, you know. Uh, 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 put it in your bottle and drink it. I don't care what you do with it. I don't care. God is right. God is perfect. Man is imperfect. God is infallible. Man is fallible. God is infinite. Man is finite. God is all-knowing. Man is limited. It's okay that you don't like some of the things that God has done or, or some things that he went about doing. Sure, if my dad didn't like it when his, his father what, passed away at 54, 52. Passed away at 52. Mom passed away. I mean, kind of grew up. Pretty much on his own after, I mean, wife, kids, the family was spread apart the country. They weren't like super tight knit. He's kind of on his own. Some of you have been through things. Look at Job. Job wasn't like, yeah, this is wonderful. No, Job, Job was like, what? what is going on? What is happening? You've got some things that are going on in your life that you say, what is happening? Heavenly Father, well, show me the way. Show me the way. No matter how you feel about it, no matter how you feel, God is to be praised just on the basis of who he is alone and apart from the blessing that he gives us. So Satan denied that, though. Satan denied it. God is to be praised without any blessings. But Satan says this. He says in chapter 1, verse number 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Job, Job, fear God, for not hast thou not made a hedge about him? And about his house, and about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. See, there it is again. Satan. Remember over in Genesis 1? Eve said, uh, the Lord said, you know, no. And what did said Job say? Uh, half the Lord said, at the Lord said. And same here in this instance. It wasn't about the Lord this time. Really, it was about Job. But Job was a righteous man. Job was a man that God believed in. Job was a man that God sort of counted on, if you will. And he said, Satan denied that whole fact about praising the Lord despite the blessings. But here's the wonderful thing about this. That Job, or that Satan denied that fact, but Job proved Satan wrong. Look at verse number 20. Verse number 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now look at chapter 2, verse number 10. But he said unto her, this is his wife said, Cursed, she said, Job, may you retain thine integrity, just curse God and die. And he said unto her, But that thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now let me ask you, well, I'll, 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 I'll kind of tell you. If God is the ruler and maker and controller of all, and he is, and we are his. Doesn't he get a right? Doesn't God retain the authority to say, 
You know what? I think you could serve me a whole lot better with one less leg. I think you could serve me a whole lot better if you lost it all. Maybe bring you back to where you need to be. You could serve me a whole lot better if you go through this hardship. Not only could you serve me better, but you could understand me better. You can know me better. You'd really have to, well, that's a bad joke, never mind. Uh, dark humor, I was going to say, with one last leg, you'd really have to lean on the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Does everybody in this room have both their legs? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, listen, we've had people, listen, I can name three people right now that came to this church, and they're good people, good people, and they've lost their legs. And I know I know two of them would laugh at it. I don't know about the third. Uh, I didn't know her that well. Um, and yeah, you, you know her. She was dating a fella of a family that used to come here. They had a child together. Yeah, okay. Uh, the other two, the other fellow was um, uh, Brother Tim, and the other one was Brother Dan. Um, do what? Dan Keys. Yeah, Dan Keys, Brother Dan Keys. Uh, but uh, he probably beat me up after the service, though. Uh, but, <laughs> but regardless, regardless uh, again, uh, this hardship, God says, man, this hardship comes into your life. I reserve the right to move you on the chessboard how I want to. Who are we to fight against? He, he, he has your best interest in mind. Mm -hmm. The only reason why we feel contrary to that is because we're trying to serve our self interests and not his. The only way we, the only reason why we get mad at God for when bad things happen in our life is because our plan was different than his. And because we look at it and say, God, why don't you get with my program? And God says, I will, when you get with my program. I'll hook you up when you hook me up. I'll help you out when you help me out. That's draw nigh to me, and, and draw nigh to God, and he shall draw nigh to you. Number one. Uh, 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 the book, the book of Job, it defends the absolute glory and perfection of God. Number two, the question of suffering is addressed. Why do we suffer? Why do we suffer? Who causes it? Why doesn't God do something about it? Uh, not all these questions can be answered. They can't, I mean, how many times people in this room, you've, you've done counseling or, or, or um, uh, maybe just trying to help a friend and they ask you that. They say, who, why do we suffer? Why does this happen? Who caused it? Who's at fault? And why doesn't God intervene and do something about it? Not all these questions can be answered, but some points can be made. Some points can be made. All right, write these. Write this down if you're writing them down. If you're listening, if you're listening, listen closely. Very, I'm going to give them to you. Uh, uh, one, two, three. All right. Number one, man is unable. Man is unable to uh, bring a conclusion. Bring a conclusion to human existence and its suffering. I know it's wordy, so put that how you'd like it. But man is unable to come to a conclusion on human existence and its suffering. It's, and I said it at the beginning. It's an age-old question. They'll keep asking it. Why? 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 Number two. Suffering is not always a result of personal sin. Suffering is not always a result of personal sin. Get that now. You say, man, am I going through this because I, I did something wrong? I could be the case. Is that a possibility? Sure. Yes, it is. Hit your thumb with a hammer. You'll find out. Consequences really quick. Consequences really quick. Sometimes it is. But not all times. And the moment you do that, you begin to beat yourself up and, and get a sphere of fear and a failure and a flop. And that's not the case at all. When God is patient and kind, suffer, number one, man can't give a summary of human existence and suffering. Number two, suffering is not always a result of personal sin. And number three, suffering may be allowed as a complement to your spirituality. Suffering may be allowed as a complement to your spirituality. You say, what? Suffering's a, a compliment? Man, you go come up and slap me in the face and say, man, I just want to let you know you look sharp today. I'm going to be like, wait, 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 what? What just happened? I was assaulted and then compliment? No, the assault is the compliment. You say that doesn't make any sense. 
That's hard to come to a understanding of. As I said earlier, when Job came or when Satan came to God and said and said, "Hey, you're blessing Job. You're helping Job. He's got no reason to fear. Take everything away from him. He'll curse you to your face." And God said, "No." I won't. Or at least, well, let's find out if he will or not. Let, let's see if he, if he will or not. Now, I wonder, I wonder, tonight, as we sit here, has Satan and God ever had a conversation about you? Me? Has, Satan, has Satan ever said, or here, let's just clump us all together here and say, I wonder if Satan's ever had a conversation with God about three rivers. Because there we go. That's a commonality that we all have. Yes, we're all saved, but a common place, a common thing. Has Satan ever said, Lord, have you ever considered three rivers? And God said, yeah, well, what about them? He said, well, you, you gave him that maniac preacher, Doug Jackson, who's, <laughs> who, who's you know, if, that, if anybody could set hell on fire, it would be him and three rivers. Uh, and we're doing it in Fort Wayne. We've been doing it in Fort Wayne. And God said, all right, well, let's see what you got for me. You can, you can do everything you want besides kill him. And then what does Satan come along and do? Ah, it's all history. But, were we, did, we ever, did we ever curse God? And I don't mean, you know, cussing. But did, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I stood out there talking with my sister Sarah. We were the only Jackson. My mom was sick and taking care of dad, and dad was sick all the time, and Jesse was gone, and Betty was gone, and Teresa was gone, and everything. Sarah and I stood out there all the time, and we thought, what's happening? What are we going to do? And I would always feel bad when we would leave on a, on a note of, dis of being distraught. So the next time I came around, we were standing outside, it was either Wednesday or Sunday, and I said, well, let's pray. Let's just pray. After we got done complaining and venting to one another, I said, let's pray. And we prayed. And we prayed. Because in it all, in it all, I learned all kinds of very valuable lessons. I grew spiritually. But in it all, I said, God's still God. This is his church. This is his book. We are his people. He has not abandoned us. Amen. We're going to be all right. Amen. And I think in Job's heart, he said, I'm God's man. God's my father. I've retained my integrity. The very lips of my wife have said so. I am not going to abandon my God because I don't understand everything that has happened, but I know my God hasn't abandoned me. I know he hasn't. And as we dig into this book of Job, I think there is going to be some incredibly, incredibly wonderful, applicable messages that you and I will be able to take and feast on uh, and, and really make a part of our lives and say, I now look at suffering, I now look at testing and temptation differently than I ever have before in my life. You see, suffering is not always the enemy. It seems as a, it seems like a mean enemy. Uh, but sometimes it can be, after it's all said and done, a wonderful teacher. A wonderful teacher. And if we will look at suffering the way that God has intended it for His people, you can say, look, I'm not looking to suffer, but I'll know how to handle it when it comes. And I'll know and I'll know how to use it for my good and his glory. I thank God for the suffering of Job. Because it's taught me. And it can teach us. And uh, that that's just one book with just a cluster of verses from one chapter. This right here is. I'll use this word, but it doesn't really say it the way I want to say it. It's unsearchable. Or here I'll put it, it's boundless. It's higher than we could ever reach. It's deeper than we could ever descend to. It's wider from coast to coast than we could ever travel. This book right here is not a book that you just read one time. It's a book that you make for life. It's something that you attach to you for life. For life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the book of Job. Lord, I thank you for the life of Job. Lord, I, I look forward to meeting Job one day and kind of maybe asking some uh, finer questions. And, uh, and Lord, I don't know if it's something we'll be able to, I'm, I'm not sure how it all play out, but I look forward to meeting you.
But Lord, now I'm going to enjoy and glean from this harvest field of truth uh, and, and, and make a meal of it. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you would help us to dig into the Word. I remember my dad, Father, preached a message years ago called uh, Dig In Every Night, or at least that's, I remember him saying that over and over and over again about the jungles of Vietnam and how to survive and an old wily veteran walking out said, dig in every night. That foxhole, dig in. And Lord, this book right here is more than just a foxhole. It's our armament. It's artillery. It's, it's everything we need. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us. Help us to understand and realize how important your word is that we might learn from it get patience from it and comfort from it in our suffering. Lord, I'd ask that you would help every soul here tonight that's suffering in one way or another. Everybody here is fighting some battle. Everybody here is going through something. Lord, I, I would ask that you would help them to go home tonight and read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If they know it by heart, quote it. But Heavenly Father, we, we need you Lord, we'd ask that you would come through only how you can. Answer our prayers if need. Oh, Lord, there's so much to pray, so much to say. But tonight as we close, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you would give us mercy as we travel home. Help everyone who arrives safe. Uh, and uh, bring us back Saturday and Sunday. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the empty tomb. We look forward to heaven. We ask these things. We pray these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.